Guys, welcome back to the Purpose Podcast, where we talk about all the reasons why we do the jobs we do every single day. This week, I'm joined by John Bradford, who is one of the VCs at Dynamo um, Ventures. He has joined me this week to talk about all the reasons why he does the job he does every single day. And I'm so glad to have him on. It's a bit different from last week's episode, where we spoke about end of life and death positive stuff, um, or anything in that space. And this week, we're talking a different venture, where we talk about a bit about what he's doing and um hear from the horse's mouth so uh, john thank you so much for joining me this week i really appreciate it i'd love to hear about a bit about yourself uh your background and we can go from there absolutely i i was worried about end of life bit there which was as, as somebody who invests in early stage businesses end of life is something i'm very familiar with but clearly not on a personal level but potentially on a startup level um background um originally from belfast a very long time ago um, have had the good fortune of uh, traveling for a significant part of my career uh, in a different version of what you've done in yours. Um, spent time in Australia, spent time in California, um, uh, keep trying to write, run away from London. And every time I run away from London, I seem to come back to, toward London. Um, so settled with a happy medium. I, I live quite close to Cambridge. Um, which means that London is not a million miles away, but I don't have to deal with uh, the, the tube on a daily basis. Um, um, how did I get to here? Uh, as I describe, I'm a, I'm a doer of many things badly. So I um, spent the best part of 10 years trying to be an accountant. Um, I've been in startup land for the best part of 20 years. Uh, I've been an early employee in some startups. I've been fortunate enough to help found a few startups. I've helped raise money for startups. I'm currently uh, investing in startups. So kind of, uh, as I described, it's kind of 360 view on the world, which is all things to do with entrepreneurs, um, entrepreneurship, um, having sat in many different seats around that that table, so to speak. And when investing in startups and the startup space, what is it that really attracts you to that? There must be something that really keeps you just like, yeah, this is where I want to be. Because obviously you've been in that space for 20 years. So there must be something that keeps bringing you back to that. Well, there's, there's, there's two parts to that question. One is to do with entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. And there's a statement around investment. So let's start with the latter one because it's easy. It's an easy question to answer. My day job is I get up every morning. I get to speak to entrepreneurs uh, about what they're doing um, and whether that's people I invest in or I don't invest in. It, it's the most interesting job in the world. And they tell me things that I kind of go, that it's a highly privileged position to 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 speak from. Um, and I'm very fortunate that um, I've kind of got to where I have and and recognize that it is a very, very privileged position. Um, uh, in the sense of entrepreneur and entrepreneurship, I think it falls into this kind of broader bucket of um, uh, when you're working with people that kind of have an itch. I mean, you've heard versions of this, I'm sure, which is people get up in the morning and they have an itch. They, they, there's something that they think needs to be fixed or is worthy of their time of fixing um and and if it's an incredibly powerful uh motivating factor uh and i describe it's when you go to bed and you think about something and you wake up in the morning and you're still thinking about it maybe you need to do something about it uh and and being part of their journey and being a, a little bit of kind of that process is is something which is again I'll use the word privileged, is, is is a privilege to be part of those journeys that some of those entrepreneurs go on. And, and we're just but a a part of the broader, the broader story. Mm. And with the in that broader story, where do you see? Because you must talk to entrepreneurs from every walk of life, then so, you know, from one side of the coin to on my where I work, which is the data science yeah. and the AI front, because that is definitely a front that is being pushed in a new direction at the minute and with increasing amounts of technology that have been re released on a dime at the minute you must see mm -hmm. every walk of life yeah i think that there is an argument and it's a, a conversation for another day mm. which is uh, do i actually see everybody from every walk of life 
or is entrepreneurship um, still reserved to a small part of the population that can afford to take time out and to do these things? One of the, the broader challenges the industry has is does um, does entrepreneurship and starting businesses represent as a universal statement the, the broader population? And keep it simple without getting overly complicated about it, 50% of the population is female. 50% of um, entrepreneurs are definitely not female. Um, and there is a, a strong argument to basically say um, women look and consider things in a very different way, but they also see problems that bluntly men don't see. Um, and, and so does the broader statement of society um, not benefit from um, those, that gender, that those people actually being part of the broader community? So, so I think um, to, to your question, I see a broad diversity. Is it broad enough? Probably not. And, and this, that's only just a statement about gender. If you kind of get into a statement about race and socioeconomic uh, issues, um, then it's even broader. There, there is arguments which basically say people who are privileged enough to have parents, middle class parents, that um, mean that they can go and do things and take a year out to start a business, um, definitely benefit from that. Um, more so than somebody who who may not necessarily have or come from that sort of background. It's, it's a really interesting point because you you get that's this perspective where your background can really determine a lot. It, re- it really, really can. Um, I came from a, when if I always use the example of my brother, when my brother was born, he's only a year and a half older than me. And we were born with holes in the windows and we had to get a grant from our council to afford to, you know, actually have a roof over our heads when I was born. Um, And that, so then to see my parents work to where they are today is, you wouldn't wouldn't think twice, you'd say, how have you managed to get here based on that? But it comes, there's so many variables and um, right time, right place. There's certain things that happened in the market even from a from a property perspective that happened that allowed society at that time if you're in the property market to make money it's it's it, there's so many it's like it's like bitcoin and all the cryptocurrency at the minute if you were an early investor in say dogecoin for example yeah. you're you now have if you even if you had one or two your that coin is now worth some stupid amount of money um yeah. it's it's crazy to see how that's that, that's evolved um, and that's only been around for the best. It was, it's like been around that long. And mm. for those who invested and have sold, they have made an absolute fortune. Um, but it's it's not to say that it, it, circumstances do change. Absolutely. But it, I, I do absolutely agree there that it's a, it's a variable of your circumstances and what is in front of you and how you yeah. approach those situations. Am I right? But interestingly, that, that can also act as a stimulus. Mm. Um, so it doesn't change the underlying when you look at the numbers, the, the, the demographics. And it's not to say that people cannot kind of pull themselves up and, and move through the ranks in a way that uh, it, it's not limited to just a demographic, but there are certain demographics which benefit from that better than others. I mean, an example, and someone who you should definitely try and uh, uh, bounce my brain off a wall and, and get on this call. This podcast is a guy called Dwayne Jackson. Mm. And uh, Dwayne, I don't know if you come across him, basically uh, he wrote a personal book uh, called 4,000 Days, mm. um, My Journey from Prison to Business. And essentially it's the most astounding story you'll ever hear. But essentially, and he tells it so much better than I, but he was in a children's home. He learned to teach himself how to code in the corner of the room. Um, he ended up in, in Texas with a, a few too many drugs in his bag that he shouldn't be have. Um, he had a judge who basically gave him one last chance. Uh, and then he went and built, uh, for love of God, a software platform for accountancy. Uh, like You can probably not think of something more random than that. 
Um, and 10, 12 years later, he sold the business for uh, 25 million pounds, I believe, or kind of something of that help. Wow. And, and he went through the whole journey. And, and I have massive, massive uh, uh, kudos to the guy. He, he, he really went, he walked the walk, talked to talk and kind of pulled himself from the bottom up um, and, and recognizes that and, and is very humble with it as well. And so the point being is it can be done, but maybe we should try and find a way to, for more people to be able to kind of go on that journey rather than remove some of the the look and happer stance that you kind of need to sometimes on that journey. Like entrepreneurship is a function of randomness in a way, but you can do things to improve one's likelihood of being able to go on that journey and, and benefit from it as well. And it's, it's also, it's not for everyone as well. Like you say, it is limited to a certain sector or section of society in the sense that not everyone can do it. If you had a world and it was full of Richard Branson's, the, nothing would ever get done. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the universe is made up of, I kind of describe that statement of there's, there's an emerging market of one of pinners. Yeah. Um, and the kind of people who feel like, oh, I should be an entrepreneur and actually realizing that actually there's actually only a small number of people who are really, really good at it. Yeah. Um, um, however, that's the, the other side of that coin is trying to encourage more people to engage and participate in that community. You don't have to be the CEO of the startup uh, to benefit or be part of that journey um, and trying to encourage people um, to not necessarily do the usual job and to potentially look at a broader spectrum of opportunities, which include working in startups is actually one of the other things to think about, which is I talk about it a lot. And when I think about it myself, I talk about um, this kind of athletes and coaches and sometimes the best coaches were never the best athletes, yeah. Uh, and some, and just because you're a world class athlete doesn't necessarily equate to you're a good coach. So you kind of find have to find your peace in the universe. And the bit I think, uh, if I kind of uh, thirty years later of kind of having done various bits and pieces in my life, the bit I think I'm good at uh, is I'm a good coach. I'm not necessarily a good entrepreneur, yeah. Um, and, and realizing that there is a difference between, uh, the giving advice and to be able to poke and prod in the right places at the right time, but recognizing that there, there is a very small universe of amazing people who have the capacity to go and do amazing things, th th this kind of generation of entrepreneurs. Absolutely. And that with this generation of entrepreneurs, it'd be interesting to see where, what what comes out and for example I've, I've 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 talked to people from the top of you know we're talking ctos to uh coos down to the, the mini startup where they're just in the, they're in the infancy stage even pre-seed and they're, they're they're talking about all these great ideas and some really really talented people and they're just finding trying to find their feet still now and get into a position where they can do it but it also comes down to the, though that one percent i'd even say it's less than one percent that can do it and do it well have such an impact on the, the way we see the world today and um even a company i'm talking with at the moment who have come to the spotlight recently um a company called ethics grade actually um and they're they're holding um in a way big big social media big platforms that have a lot of traction in terms of viewership and all the rest of it and uh, time spent on on ad um they are basically hold an account in like a trust pilot way they're saying what you're what you're providing is this xyz and they're seeing such a need for it in the market and it's one of these these platforms that will hopefully provide social good to society and make the internet a better place but mm -hmm. it, it's it's um businesses like that that we don't have enough of i feel like and it's yeah. just someone who's willing to take the leap and do it and spend the time and investment and 
you know, hours and hours of craft to get to that point to bring something into society that would do good, I suppose. Um, yeah. but, but in in question to that, then, um, and in question to the podcast, as we talk about every single week, it's why we wake up every single day and do the job we do. So, what really you talking to entrepreneurs all the time? What really pushes you to help others? What pushes me to help others? Um, don't know because it's a good thing to do mm. interesting uh, because it's, it's addictive i mean people do repeat do things and repeat them and more often than not not because somebody's holding a gun to their head mm. but because they enjoy it or because actually there's there's something which is unique and different about it uh coming back to the the point i made earlier is i'm in a massively privileged position i speak to 40 new entrepreneurs startups on a weekly basis whatever the number is uh, sometimes they're in the portfolio sometimes they're third parties i get to like pick through the bones of like what they're doing i get to ask them questions which sometimes you kind of poke yourself and go like this is i'm dealing with highly confidential information that they're disclosing to me in a highly privileged way um like it's 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 like getting up every day and being Richard Dimbleby and basically saying, I get to ask all of these questions of these startups and they don't think twice about responding or kind of giving me their version of the truth or the, the reality that they're existing in. So it, for somebody who might have maybe described as intellectual curiosity, um, it's an amazing job. And mm. and the other thing to think about is I spend my life uh, as, as an investor Dynamo only invests in supply chain and mobility businesses. So that's all we invest in. But what I do is if you imagine you keep speaking to enough different people who are coming up with different ideas in a given subject matter, after you've spoken to five of those people, you suddenly know things. Individually, they know their own kind of siloed information. Yeah. When you speak to five of them back to back, you suddenly can start joining the dots between all of those different individuals, yeah? Um, when it's not five, it's 10. When it's not 10, it's 20. When it's 40, it's 100. Suddenly, you have this capacity of being able to pull together all of this information from all of these independent individuals who kind of tell you all of their insights and thoughts. It clearly doesn't make take a lot of time for somebody who's not particularly smart, having spoken to 30 or 40 really smart entrepreneurs to suddenly start sounding smart, yeah? And it's not because I'm seeing things that are different from other people. It's because I've been privileged enough to be told all of this information by these parties and then being able to weave them together and see things or potentially create insights that they may not see individually. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's when when you can see things in a way, and like you said, when you're putting a piece of a puzzle together, it's very much similar in the job I do at, to, in, in full transparency from the sense of, I know it's two completely different things, um, but my job is very much connecting dots and seeing yeah. where, where someone will fit in here. It happened about two weeks ago. Um, someone approached us and said, we're looking for this really intelligent guy somewhere yes. in your market can you help us out i knew a guy who was looking for a job who'd been looking for six months i just happened to have gone and had a, a, a eureka bulb moment and mm -hmm. next thing i know he's gone to interview he's done the process and he got offered last week and yeah. it just happened to be that he just fitted that description of we're looking for someone really intelligent. And it was just, and I just had that moment where I was like, this is probably the guy you want to speak to. I would push back on that and say, these podcasts are a version of what I do in a day job. Yeah. You phone people and you, you email people and say, I'd like you to participate in my podcast. I'm guessing that the vast proportion of them basically say, yeah, I'd love to come on. You get to ask them a bunch of questions. And so you start to understand any given particular sector or, topic that they may be discussing but then you can suddenly go when you're doing this on a weekly basis you start to piece the, all of those different elements together it's the the reason i would ask you we should be basically saying why do you do 
the job you do? Why do you do podcasts? And I'm guessing a part of that is I get to ask questions that I wouldn't ordinarily get to ask people. And I get to hang out with people I wouldn't ordinarily get to hang out with. That's that's pretty much, you've pretty much answered the how I'd answer the question, to be honest, um, because there's, there's quite a few points to why I do the podcast. Um, one of which is to help one person every episode. Um, I'm very much someone who's driven by helping people. Um, and if I can, someone watch this or someone watch a previous episode and go, that was really useful. I really like what you did there. Do more of that. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll bring on more people like that. Um, as we work in the data front, our, a lot of the work we deal with is data scientists. Um, so again, I have a massive, massive passion for tech. But a lot of the conversations I've had with people over the last year is very, very much, I'm lost. I don't have direction. I have purpose, hence the Purpose Podcast. And I've sat there and said, okay, how can I provide more value back to the community I serve? And so we sat down in February and said, okay, let's build a podcast where we can talk about all the reasons why we do the do the job we do. And off the back of that, we we talked to a wide range of honestly, I've, I've talked from all walks of life how I've had who, who have come to the podcast, and it's it's just interesting to see how people have taken the conversation and fed it into someone else and found something else from it, and the value add that it's provided has been it's been really incredible to see. But for me, it's it's also an opportunity just to just to talk to someone who, who might have something different to share that someone yeah. else might not think of, and you might go and show this to someone and say that was really interesting because that's allowed me to do X, Y, Z. And so be it something else magical forms out of it. And um, like I say, with any podcast, it's, it's just about doing it and regularly producing the content and getting out the conversation. Um, so in, in sense to the last question that I asked around uh, what pushes mm -hmm. you, to we've kind of covered that in quite a lot of depth to be fair. Um, but in, Another aspect, do you ever find that when you're trying to advise, say, an entrepreneur on what they're doing, do you ever find that there's a blocker and they're not listening to what advice you have to give them? Because it, being a coach is very different, as you say, to being an entrepreneur. Regularly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's kind of okay. Hmm. Yeah. So, so kind of it can be one of, a number of reasons for that. One is I'm articulating myself badly. Two is um, the person's just not open to, to getting feedback. They're not coachable. Um, uh, and three is uh, I could be full of BS and, and it's worthy of ignoring. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just but one person. I think one of the things I generally say to people and I hear that I'll say this a lot to people, which is, yeah, look, you might want to take advice from me, but what I'd always refer to is go and speak to two or three other people, get their feedback, get their thoughts, like what, what my opinion is, and maybe you have to contextualize it. And if it's to do with tennis, like I would give you the most rubbish information. If you want to talk to me about early stage venture capital and supply chain, I might be able to give you in a context, much better advice. But but think of it, advice is kind of a data point, yeah? So it's like, I'm telling you this, but why don't you go and speak to two or three other people and ask the same question and see what they say? And actually, it's when you blend all of that information together, uh, it's actually then you can start to make a much more informed decision. So it's like when three people say the same thing, back to back maybe there's a point there yeah if if three people have three different opinions then what you have to go is maybe there isn't a right or wrong answer to this i need to figure out what the right answer for my circumstances or my context is um and so you just have to constantly think about those things uh, and, and not kind of come in with the ego of i'm right you're wrong or you should be listening to my advice so I, I think sometimes you just have to kind of dig in that little bit more um, and kind of always, when you find yourself in those positions, what you also sometimes have to think about is think about where the person on the other side of the table is coming from. What is their, why are they thinking the way they are? Why are they behaving the way they are? There was a recent example of I was um, dealing with 
an entrepreneur and um, this described, I felt that some of the things he was trying to do were irrational. Yeah. Uh, or I couldn't understand why he was behaving the way he was. And when we dug into it um, and spent some little, a bit of time around it, what was actually happening was he had faced us exactly the same problem that we are facing today in a different universe, different contexts with different individuals. And what actually ended up happening on that occasion was the, the, the other parties involved in the process, they say they didn't act in the most honorable way possible. Right. And so therefore it had created this kind of natural uh, adversity to, to a particular like reaction. They reacted in a certain way because historically something had happened. It'd be like, like it's like kicking a dog. Uh, it's like in a certain circumstance, a dog had been regularly kicked. Yeah. And suddenly you kind of go, why is the dog the way it is? It's because of circumstance. And so, so you constantly have to kind of look around and evaluate all of the different reasons why that may happen. Um, um, and, and sometimes coming back to it, some people are not coachable. And one of the things that we'll look for when we, we, uh, invest in a startup is is how coachable are the entrepreneurs how fixated in the ways are they what they do it's kind of this uh statement which is strong opinions loosely held yeah uh, which is a nice way of basically saying we want to work with people who really are highly opinionated yeah about things because as an entrepreneur you have to be opinionated However, and so not kind of swaying in the, the, the breeze of public opinion and changing every five minutes. However, you do have to be open to changing those opinions. Yeah. If, if a robust and a proper debate is had and suddenly goes, I thought that, but there's good reason why I shouldn't be thinking that way. I should be thinking this way. That's okay. So strong opinions loosely held is kind of a kind of slightly symbiotic way of describing how you want to try and find the right people to, to be coaching and to be supporting. Sorry, that was quite long-winded. No, but it was interesting. It's an interesting point to like look at it. It's, you've got to be open-minded to allow you to see things from a different perspective. Like you say, take three people's opinions. Yeah. And you can either listen to all of it or none of it, and you can mm -hmm. keep in your old way. But if you do listen to it and you do take a different direction, then you'll probably get to where you want to be. But again, it, 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 this is so um, in the in the theoretical sense of the way we're talking at the minute. It's it's completely different until you put the advice into actual context, and it's like actually that's quite that that could allow you to you know do X Y Z. Um, and with the advice that you give to entrepreneurs, do you use any advice that you've gone through your career is there anything that you really echo in your conversations i think the thing i regularly say to people is go and find the smartest person in the subject matter and ask them the question it's 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 a very natural and easy reaction you'll ask me a question about something and and oh god i have opinions about everything yeah some of which are have substance and some of which are completely have no substance behind them at all yeah yeah but yeah. and we live you know this in in social media has driven a version of this which is everybody's got a bloody opinion about bloody everything yeah it doesn't make them an expert yeah so it's easy to have an opinion mm -hmm. uh to have knowledge and, and thoughtfulness behind it is two different very different things and being able to decouple those is really important yeah. so the piece of advice i always have is if you're faced with a problem, try to think about the, the smartest person in your network that knows most about that topic and go and ask them. Yeah. I can give you my opinion, but it's, uh, it's an uninformed opinion. Yeah. You need to go and find those other people. And, and, and this was a conversation I had an hour ago. Like I, I was talking to somebody about a given topic. And I kind of said, my instinct says this sort of feels like what you should do, but it's purely instinctive and there's no, no depth, no experience, no knowledge of a given subject about it. 
why don't you why don't we figure out who in our both our Rolodexes knows the most about this topic and we'll sit down and we'll have a conversation with them in the room. And suddenly actually their their working knowledge or is, is used elsewhere, standing on the shoulders of giants, standing on the shoulders of somebody who actually actually has knowledge and capability about a given subject is the best place to go in in solving those sorts of problems. And kind of Coming back to the word, I've been heavily involved around accelerators. Accelerate your knowledge base is is really important. That's that's kind of the and and I was thinking kind of back on your original comment. The thing you have to remember is entrepreneurs are also like kids, children. Yeah? yeah, you can stand there all day and you can give them the advice of what they should and shouldn't do, and they'll still go and do something totally different. And you've got to be okay with it. Yeah, kids are the same. Sometimes you just have to learn through doing rather than just kind of be like, well, you told me I shouldn't do it that way, so I won't. Like anybody who's got kids realizes that just never happens. Even now, even now I get advice. Um, and to anyone listening who who knows me well, I, yeah, I you, you've probably, my friends have probably given me advice at some point in the past and I've gone, I appreciate what you've said, but I'm going to ignore it. And it's, it, it's, it's just natural and, and by the way, you'll probably come back in, in three weeks and say, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. <laughs> exactly. And it's it's like you say, any advice is good, good advice. Talking, I find that with talking to someone, I can provide my my own, my head thinks in its own way sometimes. Uh, and it's really hard to explain and echo it. But I could be thinking so up here, but it won't come out. And it, it until I start talking about it, what I was thinking in my head then formulates into some form of speech or solution to the, what I was trying to work out. And before I know it, I've got this magical bit of advice that I was trying to find from someone, but I'd had it all along. I just needed to, to talk it out. And then, yeah. you know, one thing led to another and boom. Um, and it's interesting that when you can do that, it allows you to just, it, it brings out quality in people, doesn't it? That's called therapy. Exactly. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, and it happens in a couple of different occasions. Sometimes it's just the ability to try and articulate the problem to somebody else mm. helps you to better understand what the problem is. Yeah, is, is the first one. And the second one where it's even more poignant. Uh, so when I uh, invest, sometimes there are what is known as two or three founders who will be starting a business. Sometimes you have single founders. Yeah. And actually being a single founder is actually really difficult because you kind of know everything you need to know and it's all in your brain and you have to carry it. But sometimes just talking to another person actually helps you. And if you've got co-founders, your ability to bounce ideas off each other and to spark ideas is much easier. Decision-making process is much easier when you've got two or three people to kind of bounce ideas and things off. If you're the single founder of a business, that's actually really difficult because you kind of you, no matter what you do, even if you're expressing it and speaking aloud to yourself, you need somebody to bounce or to spark ideas off. And sometimes is what sometimes you'll have executive coaches for CEOs or founders. Yeah, uh, and one of the things that we actively try to do as investors is with the uh, portfolio companies is act as a a, a a sounding board to bounce things off. Yeah. And to try and flesh some of those ideas out or to try and figure out what, what those things are. But more often than not, we are, we're not the knowledgeable ones. We're not the ones that have the subject matter expertise. It's the other person. And so it's a lot of it's just to draw out some of that to try, to your point, actually figure out what you already know. And in retrospect, was bloody obvious but you almost needed to kind of go through the process to, to get to that bit, that nugget. It's interesting as well, because as we are in our business at True North, we, we are, a, uh, let's say, early stage still startup. Um, we're only 18 months in. And it's, I was, I would, like you say, I was, I was the first employee in. And it's, there's a level of, so the role isn't just, you know what part parcel consultant i'm not i don't just do that i'm also a marketer i'm also producing out content on a regular basis um trying out new automation tools to allow our job to be more effective and slipstream 
um, and we're using the technology we have in society that um, my MD didn't have 10 years ago. Um, and we're just automating a lot of our work to allow us to do more of the stuff that we need to do to, to, to generate business in a way. And it's, it's incredibly challenging to see it from this perspective where you're in an early stage startup, you're trying to build company culture, you're trying to build a team that understands your values, your mission, um, aligns with that mission as well um, in a way that can allow you to effectively work as a, as a collaborative team. It's, and there's, there's so many moving parts to, to a business at this level and um, growing the, 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 at the right time as well. There's so many, it's really hard to echo to anyone who hasn't done it or not going through it unless you've done it like yourself, you've witnessed people yeah. do it countless times. Uh, and there are so many moving parts that, like you said about the entrepreneur, it's, you've got to treat it like a child. It's like one moment you're doing this, the next minute you're doing that. Um, and you just have to constantly pivot to, to to move with the times. And when you can do that effectively, that's when the, the, the dime drops and it can open up so much opportunity. And in the work you do, because you obviously talk to, like you say, it's, it's a small part of people in, in retrospect, but there must be a myth that comes with the work you do. There must be some common myth that you anticipate on a daily basis or uh, ad hoc basis um, that comes up and you go, that's an absolute load of tosh. It must, is there anything that really springs to mind? Mm, I think there's, there's a lot of cliches in, in our universe. Mm. Um, I think the, the odd part, I don't know if this really answers your question is, in, in some respects, there is a repeatability about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. But equally on top of that, you constantly have to be aware of the fact that actually there is a set of randomness that exists around all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in, in being in the right place at the right time, certain things happen. Um, we've, the irony is, uh, I jumped into doing this job 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd say it's probably now more like two years. Uh, two years ago, nobody cared for supply chain. Yeah. Uh, then a pandemic turned up. Who was to know? Didn't expect that to arrive, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Didn't expect, so... All the conversations we're having are about shortages of toilet roll. Yeah. People are having conversations about Brexit and trucks at um, Dover. People are talking about um, container ships that are trying to do three-point turns in the middle of the Suez, Suez Canal. Yeah. All of these are conversations about supply chain. Yeah. Mm. It always was there. But it was kind of, it was just always below the surface. It just happened and nobody really thought about it. Mm. I suspect more people have had uh, conversations about supply chain or has been in news articles in the last 18 months. That's not me being particularly bright and intelligent. It was always there. Mm. It just happened that through a series of random events that it suddenly become an important part of that. Yeah, there's a business in Manchester called Hopin, and this is not me trying to uh, degrade them because they're an amazing business, started a platform um, to essentially allow people to run online events, conferences, internal enterprise type events. Yeah, um, it's about a year and a half old. Uh, it's now the fastest growing startup on the planet. Mm -hmm. It did $70 million worth of ARR last year. Mm. Uh, it's exploding. Yeah. If there hadn't been a pandemic, maybe the numbers wouldn't be just as aggressive as they are today. So, so there is this kind of, there's these pieces together that you can kind of start to create mm. some formula, A follows B follows C, but there's this kind of constant randomness that kind of exists in the universe which sometimes means some things work and sometimes don't. Yeah. Like if, if entrepreneurship was 
completely predictable. Repeat entrepreneurs would repeatedly actually get successful businesses. And in theory, the businesses get more and more successful. Yeah. The reality is, even if you're a successful entrepreneur, that is no determinant upon the success of the next business. Actually, the the example that somebody once gave me, and and there is uh, data around this to prove it, which is, let's say you have a successful startup. The next one is actually not likely to be as successful uh, because ego takes over. I'm amazing. I've done this amazing business, made a bunch of money. Third one is highly likely to be successful because they're so pissed off that the second one didn't work that actually they're going to do everything and not leave anything to chance and luck in the third one. So you kind of end up in this kind of weird randomness, Mm -hmm. even in kind of a universe of some level of predictability. I don't think that answered the question, but it answered the question. It does. No, it does. It's it's, it's quite interesting to see how that, if one informs the other, I see yeah. that it's 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 one and all to be to be completely frank. Because um, the questions that I ask tend to be lend just to a conversation that always seems to move elsewhere, and it goes into a space that hasn't really been spoken about, and it, it lends for something else. So it, it does answer more 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 so than needed. Um, and. In all of this, there's quite a lot of revolving conversations that we've taken from it. And do you find that when you are in the work you do, do you ever find that there's influence from others? Is there anyone that has majorly influenced you to in the conversations you have? You know, like this could be family members. It could be it could be anyone really. I know you mentioned um, you mentioned uh, chap called uh, was it Jackson, I believe, earlier in the conversation. Yeah, uh, Dwayne Jackson. Is there anyone that? Is he someone that's influenced you to, to date to, the, to what you do today? Um, probably the person that's influenced me most, and this is kind of a little bit not quite where you're expected to go, is is the guy David Cohen. David David set up a business called Techstars in Boulder. I'm going to get this wrong. Two thousand and eight ish, two thousand seven, two thousand eight, and from which Techstars started in Boulder. It grew to about four or five programs in the U.S., and I joined at number six. So I was the person who helped set up uh, the sixth program, which was the very first international program. And today there's over 40 of these programs, Techstars programs, running around the world. Um, And one of the things I learned from him and uh, his co-founder of Techstars, a guy called Brad Feld, was the singular concept of give first. Um, And it was, there's been a bit of a universe up until recently that everything's very transactional. Yeah. I get something, you get something back. Yeah. It's like, you owe me a favor. Um, I'm going to keep a list in my head of all the favors that I've called in or I've given to people. And at some point I'm going to come back and ask for something. And, and the concept they had was actually if you kind of surround yourself in a universe of just being helpful and, and not really thinking about why one would do something, but doing it in a positive fashion, yeah, um, one, one of two things kind of basically happen. One is you kind of surround yourself with this kind of nature of serendipity. And the more you're helpful, the more you enhance the chances of serendipity being positive towards you yeah the 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 weird part is that you don't know when it's going to pay back and where it's going to pay back and from whom it's going to pay back and how it's going to pay back but you do know that if you kind of create enough of this goodwill and support and being positive and giving first that it will universally the universe has a way of paying back some way yeah um, but you just have to avoid trying to join the dots on the way through. You can see the dots in yeah. retrospect, can kind of go, I understand how that happened, but you can't see it going forward. You can see it in retrospect. And an example on his side was um, he helped me um, set up 
uh, the first accelerator outside of the US in Middlesbrough, of all bloody places, yeah, in 2009. Um, four years later, he came and knocked on my door and said, I'm thinking about doing a program internationally. Would you like to come part of Techstars? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't know that in helping himself or me helping me in Boulder in 2009, mm-hmm. he was ironically helping himself four years later to help do something around the expansion of tech stars internationally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's this constant kind of way that the universe kind of s- slowly pays its way around. And David was, and part of it's a US culture, part of it's a very bolder culture. Uh, and if anybody's ever had the benefit or spending time in the States, Colorado is pretty amazing and Boulder is even more amazing. And they effectively created this kind of give first culture. Um, and, and it's something that I live by every day. Yeah. It's the, the constant, the, the constant question, which you always ask at the end of every conversation is, is there anything I can do to help you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And not in a, like a glib way of like, I don't really want you to answer that question, but the more you can help the universe join some of those dots up quicker and faster, the more you benefit and the, the more the broader universe of and the ecosystem will benefit from it as well. Interesting. That's a really interesting way of looking at it. And it's, it's interesting how that advice has informed what you do now. My, my whole business approach, like it's kind of, like my world sort of knew that up to that point I met David, but he expressed it in a way that meant it kind of felt like, oh yeah, I get it now. Like that the problem is you sort of have to be generous in time and effort mm-hmm. for a while before the universe starts to pay back. Mm-hmm. And some people are impatient. If you have the ability to be a uh, patient the more you will actually benefit from from the the general approach. Interesting. And Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, no. It was absolutely interesting. That's a really interesting way of looking at it. And it's it, it patience is it's really important because if you could be patient, my job, my job is patience every single day. It's yeah. um, uh, you know, someone you can't. Our product is people, uh, so to speak. And I don't mean to call people product in that sense, but for if you're looking for a job and you want to have a chat, it's this is where we come in and say, look, here you are, where you're at, where are you going? And it gives us the opportunity to sit down and go, okay, if you're here, how can we get you from X to Y in the quickest time frame, but with the best solution for you? That's the that's the so the quickest time frame kind of gets taken out of the equation, and it's more about the individual their circumstances and where they're going um but then we've got on the other side of the coin on the other double edge of the sword is you've got the 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 client who's got this this need that needs closing in two weeks and we are quite a patient uh establishment in 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 full transparency we we don't we don't throw 101 different people at someone because they have to read it at the end of the day we'd rather send forward four people of quality who will all likely get to get to some form of stage of interview or offer at the end of the day. Um, but we know those four people understand your mission, understand your values and understand where you want to go as a business. And for us, that is a far more effective way of doing business because we know that that person's probably going to stay in that business for one, two years. When we take that approach, what we see is people actually want to continue working there. They want to continue working with us because we're providing quality, not just quantity. Um, granted, some, some businesses need qu- quantity. So just because you know, like it with like Hopin, for example, they just need people to yeah. build. They they don't have the they don't have the choice. They they're expanding. Um, the universe has thrown everything at them, and they yeah. have the they are currently just building the plane on the way down. Um, at the moment, they they have jumped off the cliff. Um, at a rate that needs the plane to be built quickly, and they are bringing people on every minute just to just to close close the shop. The, the pushback on that is they have the right product at the right time for the right people. And if you think about it, somebody better articulated this than I did was trying to find that kind of what you and I would know as kind of product market fit is it's kind of like pushing this boulder up a hill. Um, when you have product market fit, it's the equivalent of the boulder starting to roll down the other side. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of rolling ahead of you and it's completely out of control. 
and you're trying to kind of just manage it as best you can. That's where hopping is. Yeah. Uh, it didn't, didn't realize it was on the top of this bloody big mountain, which was called a pandemic and everybody was going to be stuck at home for 18 months. Yeah. Um, but they had, again, the right product, right people, right execution, right time. Uh, they are dancing. They're dancing in the, uh, in the storm really, or as best as they possibly can. And in quite, in quite honestly, it's, it's interesting to see where they'll go next. And th- again, they'll continue to grow um, because there is a massive demand. And I think the biggest scare at the minute is um, obviously there's these huge office spaces that are, that are throughout London that are com- currently unoccupied, not doing anything. Why is, why is that scary? It's not scary. scary. It's scary to see where they will take it because you can't get. It's it's really ironic because I'll use the transport example for seeing if we're talking about logistics. Um, they've because there hasn't been demand for transport as much over the last year and a half. Um, in the yeah. background, they have been slowly cutting all the services um, because there mm-hmm. hasn't been a demand for it. So they've been trying to achieve this for years and they've done it. Yeah. So what they have done is they have reduced all services to London, but they are encouraging people to go back into the office on a reduced services. So you're encouraging people to basically funnel people down on a, on a, on a much re- reduced uh, transport system and transport network. Um, I'm talking yeah. mainly to London. Um, and, but you're asking people to go back into the office. So you're not providing as much space as you were for people on, on transport. You've created this two, this uh, rule of um, yeah. two meter distance, but you're allowing people to, it's the rat race. You, you're creating a rat race when we can't afford for that to happen. So it's, they're going against their own grain and it just, it, it makes it really ironic. But the thing is with this office space, the, the prices aren't changing. The value of the buildings aren't changing. It's just at this level at the minute and there's no movement and it's like they need to revamp how they use that space otherwise we're, we're going to there's going to be an issue somewhere along the line where it's like crap where do we go now and what's scary about it is they don't know what to do with it it's just there it's just wasted space at the minute it's, it's almost derelict in a way because it won't be used in the same extent unless it's the finance industry but there needs to be an adaptability which allows for people to come in on an ad hoc basis on a hybrid model um, and places so like with, go for it with 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 um, shocks like this to the underlying ecosystem mm. creates massive opportunities. Yeah. So so to your point, so the one thing that we look at and think about a lot is the one thing that the last eighteen months has created and has fundamentally changed in society is flexible working. Yeah. Mm. The idea that somebody will continue will be forced to go back and work five days a week in an office, mm-hmm. those days are gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The need for them to potentially be in an office for part of a week exists. Yeah. yeah. But it may not be five days. So one of my personal frustrations, selfishly, is I could buy day tickets on a singular and they were prohibitively expensive, or I could buy a real ticket for a month or a year, which assumed that I was going in five days a week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As someone who lives in near Cambridge, but commutes to London on an ad hoc basis, it's a bloody nightmare. It's been costing me a fortune because I've had to buy single tickets on a daily basis. Yeah. So, so the whole of that, the, the, the structuring around tra- tariffs will change which would not necessarily be a bad thing. Um, actually, to your point, which is the City of London have, I believe, something like f- uh, projects now in place for 1,500 new uh, apartments in central London because they've recognised that there's a whole bunch of people that used to work in London are no longer going to work in London. So, mm-hmm. so I think coming back to a broader statement about entrepreneurship, shocks to the system create opportunities. Opportunities is where... Uh, entrepreneurs thrive yeah change is where things become interesting on the edge of change and where you can kind of imagine a world or a change which is slightly happening Mm. ahead of where it's obvious then things become really interesting and and to some degree entrepreneurship is is making bets on a predicted change in a system what we've just gone through 
is a massive shock and system change. With change creates opportunities, yeah? And that's the environment in which entrepreneurs thrive. Mm. Um, as an investor, those things are what gets me out of bed in the morning. And the weird part is the problems we're sort of trying to solve to some degree are slightly just over the hill, yeah? Or there, there's versions of kind of early signals towards what the world might look like. And you're kind of trying to make a bet on a prediction of what it might look like at scale if it kind of evolved, yeah? Mm-hmm. Uh, we're investors in a business called Mana, which is a drone delivery business, yeah? It's the idea that you can order your coffee in the morning by drone, yeah? It's it's not just metaphorically over the, 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 the horizon, it practically is over the horizon slightly as well. Yeah. And we believe that there is a world where that exists. Now, there, there is resistance around that, but the reality is, do I think the world would be better for it? Yes, because actually it means that I don't have to get in the car, I don't have to go to a store. The economic impact in, is positive. The environmental impact, their electric drones is much, much reduced. So, like, I have to believe that we invest in businesses which have a net positive impact across society. Otherwise, I wouldn't do what I do. Interesting, interesting. And in all of this, this is, is, I think it's a good point to kind of close off as a, as a question, really, because... In all this the positivity and what you're trying to achieve uh, through the work you do with Diamond, uh, I can't say, that, say it now. Um, Thank it, uh, yeah. And um, is there any, if you could tell me one thing, um, one bit of advice that you would give anyone? It's a book that I use from Richard Reed. if I could tell you any one thing. Um, is What a bit of advice would that be? Things are never as bad as you think they are. Interesting. And actually, you get up in the morning, and actually, you can make a change. You can make a better place. Right. And if, if everybody got up in the morning and felt that kind of way, the world would be a better place. Amazing. And you, you can't be, you can't sit in 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 a world where you just think about everything being terrible. Like you have to have some level of irrational optimism um about how we together actually helped make the world a better place and and that's not me trying to be kind of singing a michael jackson kind of lyric it, it's a general kind of view which is as an individual you can actually make a net positive improvement and change you can't just be reliant on everybody else doing it mm, amazing and john thank you so much for joining me this week's episode anytime on this week's episode of the post podcast guys tune in next week where we bring on someone else to take it down the road of the post podcast take care for now and i will see you soon